Welcome to Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent figures from government law and journalism for a dynamic discussion of the most important topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. We seem to be coming down to the wire in several consequential confrontations, yet we don't know exactly where the finish lines are drawn. Last week, the White House softened the absolutist position it had staked out for the past few months and came to the table with the Republican Congress to begin negotiating in earnest over a resolution of the debt ceiling crisis. But the contours of a final compromise remained very hard to make out, and the actual drop-dead timeline remains blurry at best, even as official estimates put it at as soon as 10 days. In like fashion, Special Counsel Jack Smith continued to assemble what looks from the outside like an overwhelming case of obstruction and unlawful retention of classified documents by Donald Trump. And each new advance made the prospect of charges more assured, but we're left guessing just how close an actual indictment might be. That prospect seems to be playing out in an entirely different universe from the political realm, where Trump's lead in the race for the Republican 2024 presidential nomination only grows with each legal setback. And in fact, Trump's competition, starting with Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, seemed to be looking at near insurmountable odds, with any path to the nomination quickly closing. To figure out where these high-stakes Washington showdowns are headed, We welcome three of the most seasoned and savvy reporters in the country, and they are Aaron Blake, senior political reporter for The Washington Post, where he writes for The Fix. He's one of the country's foremost political reporters and has been covering politics for 20 years. He previously reported for his hometown, Minneapolis Star Tribune and The Hill newspaper. Always a pleasure to welcome him back. Aaron, thanks for being here as always. Thank you, Harry. David Gura, a first time guest, if I'm not mistaken, on Talking Feds. He is a correspondent on NPR's business desk, where he's worked since 2021. Previously, he was a correspondent and anchor for MSNBC, where he hosted the weekend show Up with David Gura. He also has worked as a correspondent for Bloomberg and a senior reporter for Marketplace. David, such a pleasure to welcome you to Talking Feds. Nice to be with you, Harry. Thank you. And Amna Nawaz is the co-anchor of PBS NewsHour, a contributor to NBC News and MSNBC, and an award-winning documentary filmmaker. Before joining NewsHour, she anchored breaking news coverage for ABC News and led the network's coverage of the 2016 election. She also previously served as a foreign correspondent and Islamabad bureau chief at NBC News. Amna, thanks so much for coming back to Talking Feds. Harry, great to be with you. All right. So let's start with the high stakes, high wire uh, negotiations over the debt ceiling. And let's try to begin with a sober look at where we are really and truly if we can. So, David, you know, you've tweeted out CBO estimates significant risk that the Treasury runs out of funds in the first two weeks of June Janet Yellen has said something similar. So it it feels like 1159. But do we know if it actually is? You know, significant risk sounds a little bit like governmental wiggle room. Do we know? And if we don't, do Biden and McCarthy know when really is the hard and fast deadline? So the Treasury Secretary has said over and over again that we're getting close to this X date, the date by which the government won't be able to pay these bills. And she said that could be as soon as June the 1st. And she stressed that this is a, a really urgent matter for the Congress to take care of. I should say the Fed chair has as well. And there's been something kind of interesting. Neither of them is really willing to entertain what would happen were we to get to that point. I spend a lot of my time talking to investors and portfolio managers, a lot of whom are here in New York. And I spoke with one yesterday from a big bond firm, and I said, you seem pretty sanguine about all of this. And she corrected me. She said, no, I'm constructive. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sanguine. But I think the truth of the matter is we've been through this a number of times before, and there's always this disconnect between Wall Street and Washington. Um, but what's been amazing to me is 
how Wall Street thinks Washington is going to pull this together, and I'm curious what Aaron thinks, and I'm as well. I think in Washington, there's a sense that, you know, because of the political makeup of the Congress, this time could be different. But there have been signs this week that there is progress. You've seen negotiations taking place on Capitol Hill. There have been meetings of the Treasury Secretary and the CEOs of some of the biggest banks in this country. And there was a big letter of more than 100 executives to the president and the negotiating team from Congress stressing how important this is. So there are signs of progress. I think, you know, getting back to your question, Harry, we are getting close to midnight. We don't know when midnight is exactly. So we're kind of fumbling here and that that's a bit weird. But th- there is a sense that this needs to get done. Are folks going to be able to get it done in time? I don't know, but I do think the message is as long as progress is happening here, that that's a good sign. And and it is challenging with the president, of course, overseas. He's coming back and be able to hammer this out. But yeah, I think that there's a sense on Wall Street, at least, that there's, there is enough progress happening in Washington that people are feeling reasonably comfortable about where things are as we near this deadline. I mean, Aaron, you've actually charted it out in terms of remaining days in Congress for the Senate, et cetera. It does feel like it's also complicated. It's plausible they could find out, oh, guess what? We ran out yesterday. Do you think they know what we're working with? And is there more wiggle room than the various stakeholders are suggesting, do you think? This is my sense of things, having covered these kinds of negotiations before. Usually we get an X date that is a little bit firmer. And I'm talking not just about debt ceiling, but also kind of the fiscal cliff that we had a decade ago. In this instance, they've been kind of generally talking about early June in a way that maybe suggests that I feel like they know what they think, but they haven't said that. They just want it to get done by a certain date. And if they have a couple extra days on the back end that that helps people get something done in time, that's great. But the problem is that the way that these things work, if you look at the history of not just debt ceiling debates, but government shutdown debates, the fiscal cliff, which I mentioned, it always goes almost to the very end. Debt ceiling negotiations especially almost always conclude on the last day or the day before the last day. That's when you see these deals cut because neither side has motivation to cave on their on their wants until they know the other side or at least feel the other side is not going to cave. And so I think right now, you know, we can pay attention to what people are saying. We can pay attention to how Wall Street feels about this. And it's good that they're, you know, both sides are saying we're getting making progress. But I kind of take that with a grain of salt because generally speaking, you're not going to see them really come together until that final 24 hours, until they finally have to get there. And that's the point at which we find out how far people like the Freedom Caucus are willing to go with this, which is really the X factor in all of this. And I'm sure we'll talk about what they've said about how they shouldn't be negotiating right now. They should just pass what the House passed. I think that's really what this ultimately comes down to and, and what people are saying about it. A lot of times when, when we get to the end here, uh, we look back on, on what was said about it in real time and we'll, we'll think, well, they were just kind of saying stuff. <laughs> I'm reminded of uh, watching a soccer game and it goes into overtime and you actually don't know when the referee's going to blow the whistle. Um, so it's intriguing because both David and Aaron channeling also the views of especially sort of the New York finance industry have said, well, we've seen this before, blah, blah, blah. But it it certainly felt along the way that this is a different kind of fight because you have a group of Republicans in Congress who are indifferent, maybe eager to take us over the cliff, what would have been unthinkable before. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times we've used the word unprecedented when we're talking about (laughs) things in Washington these last few years. But if there's a sense that this is different this time for some reason, it is because of exactly those factors, because of the very narrow margin that Speaker McCarthy is working with within the Republican conference and also the nature of that margin. You have to remember exactly how much he traded away to secure that speakership from a lot of those far right Freedom Caucus members. And and they are the ones holding up the train here, right? They're the ones most vocally and most defiantly calling for those spending cuts, saying he should not be negotiating. That definitely ties Speaker McCarthy's hands. But look, we did see progress too. Well, you know, the, phrase, the other phrase we use all the time right now is, if history is a guide. We don't know if history is a guide. That's what we're basing a lot of this analysis on and our expectations on. But in terms of what we have seen, 
yes, there has been some progress that's been messaged from both President Biden and from Speaker McCarthy earlier this week. McCarthy saying he sees a path. He says, I think we have structure now. Both sides identifying who their negotiators are is also progress, right? Them being able to say, these are the folks who are going to be in the room hammering it out and the principles are being updated as we go. It's really in the hands of those negotiators right now. The White House has tapped their budget director, Shalanda Young, senior advisor, Steve Rochelle. The chief legislative liaison, Louisa Terrell, and McCarthy's tapped a lot of his top advisors, including this congressman from Louisiana, Garrett Graves, who has reportedly you know, the trust of a lot of the members of the Republican conference, including those far right members. So this is going to come down to the details. But you know what's been striking to me truly is how much of an impact it already has, even as we get close to whatever midnight is and whenever it is. Because President Biden had to cut short his overseas trip because of this. Like This impacts how the world sees the United States. It impacts other U.S. priorities and the president's agenda. So we may not default, but it is already and will have an impact. I think that something that emerged from this is just kind of this dissatisfaction with this process. And it's cool to be in this group of just us in Denmark who have to, to deal with this. But I think that <laughs> there is this sense that there's a real weirdness to the fact that we have this apparatus in the way that we govern this country. And there's been talk of changing things. And I just, not to get too hosty here, but I wanted to kind of ask you about this 14th Amendment argument that we see percolating, uh, that, you know, Biden could end this once and for all. There, there is a legal mechanism for doing that. And I'm, I'm you know, you're the, you're the lawyer. I'm curious if you find that a, a resonant argument, something that you think the president the White House could do here? Okay, I'll try in short order. And I, one of the questions was there's both that and now this resolution by Wednesday, House members, in other words, really exotic, outside the box salvation. So my take on it constitutionally is it's got a real shot. There is a constitutional command that the debt not be questioned. And as They've emphasized rhetorically what the Republicans are insisting on are are not cuts going forward, but reneging of cuts on already allocated dollars. But man, it would be a balls out move because it depends on an argument for Biden saying this. Basically, this is less unconstitutional than the alternatives. Now, he could do it actually be slapped down eventually, but still that would be a way of getting past the crisis. It is a good faith argument. Of course, what does he do then? He, If we assume that he says it's my constitutional duty, whatever the boys in Congress say to go forward, then we're looking at the minting of a $3 trillion coin or private borrowing, and that might have its own political consequences. But my take on it is it passes the red face test, even if down the line it would be um, actually rejected. But let's get back inside the box now, because it does feel as if after the two sides, especially the White House said, no way won't touch a hair on its head of already allocated money. They've blinked, right? So they are talking about cuts, although we don't know where McCarthy is. He did say, I see the path. So assuming we go that route, the sort of conventional one, what do you see as the likely candidates for cuts and how significant are they either in dollars or for people's lives? Well, so in terms of what we've heard publicly messaged so far, and this is what is causing a lot of concern and some panic among Democrats, progressives in particular, is the president recently signaling he's open to considering changes to the federal safety net programs, right? Like a work requirement, which we know is a central Republican demand. Can you just uh, explain what a work requirement means in this context? Yeah, work requirement on top of specifically, on the, well, they've already said Medicaid they wouldn't touch, right? So on top of our SNAP program or a food stamps program, attaching a work requirement to eligibility for those programs, which progressive Democrats and many Democrats oppose, Republicans have long called for additional measures of, of that kind on safety net programs. And look, President Biden has come out and said, I'm not going to accept any work requirements that go beyond what I've voted for in years past. There could be a few others I'm looking for. It was really kind of careful and not terribly clear language that led to a lot of confusion among Democrats. Pramila Jayapal, the head of the Progressive Caucus, came right out and said, I'm confused. You know, right. we didn't vote for Biden of 1986 or 96. We voted for Biden 2020. So let's be clear here. But he has made it clear this could be a possible area of negotiation. 
That's why Democrats are concerned here, because they're worried how much President Biden or his negotiators might be willing to concede to avoid that default. And we just don't know. We're not in that room right now. We're basing everything off. We are reading tea leaves and some of the messaging that's been coming out of there. And that's why progressive Democrats are signaling very carefully. We are watching every morsel of information because we will not abide. And given the political brinksmanship this entails, I mean, it feels like it goes against the DNA of the Democratic Party and especially the progressives. But if they cut that deal, isn't it near impossible either for progressives in the Senate or for Jaya Paul and company to actually th- hurl themselves you know, in front of the moving train that's the only way to, to save the economy? You know, the White House's posture initially was obviously this is not something to be negotiated over. That was Donald Trump's posture when he was president. If you can maintain that posture throughout the negotiations, you want to do that because you don't want to keep revisiting these kinds of things over and over again and kind of rewarding the other side for trying to hold these things hostage in your mind. But, you know, the debt ceiling is something that we have seen negotiation on before. Of course, a decade ago, we had the sequester that was negotiated during Obama's presidency, a similar outcome in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan. And I think you have a president in Joe Biden who, at the very least, likes to be seen as a deal maker. The ideal outcome for him here is that this doesn't involve negotiations, but you can see how he might take this and think, look, I can give a little bit here as long as they're willing to come to the middle. He's very idealistic about the prospects of bipartisanship. But I do think it opens it up to, well, they negotiated this time. Why wouldn't they negotiate the next time over the debt ceiling? And I think that's really what a lot of these more progressive members probably fear as coming out of this negotiation to the extent that the White House does actually come to the Republicans' demands to some degree. And what do you guys think? So, yes, it's true. He wants to be the deal maker, the guy who can make government work. On the other hand, this is really cutting into bone. If something like this happens, does he wind up, you know, looking statesmanlike for safeguarding U.S. interests while negotiating with children in the sandbox? Or does he wind up looking weak for capitulating to the core Republican demand after promising he wouldn't? The Republicans have been asking for a lot more than just the work requirement, right? And so I think Uh there is a possible path here where both sides get to walk away and call it a win. So the way you phrased that question, Harry, I think that is central to this is how President Biden sees his role and sees himself, which has always been back to his candidate day, selling himself as the guy who can get things done. He knows how to work across the aisle. And he did. He had a huge piece of legislation, a big bipartisan bill he can stand on. So I think that's why a lot of folks might be led to believe that there will be some kind of agreement that allows both sides to say, we got what we wanted. We raised the debt ceiling and we didn't send the country over a fiscal cliff. And also McCarthy being able to say, we got some cuts. They have to be able to carry something back to both sides to say they want. I think that there's a real question of whether the House Freedom Caucus is going to accept that thing that allows both sides to claim a victory. Mm -hmm. It's Mm -hmm. not just this most recent thing where they're saying the negotiations should stop and that they should just pass what we passed in the House. And we've talked about how the House is very closely divided. The House Freedom Caucus got a lot of concessions out of making Kevin McCarthy the speaker, even though they ultimately came around to him. They usually figure these things out. They did a decade ago. But when John Boehner was negotiating those things, he had one of the biggest Republican House majorities in a very long time. House Republicans have only a few votes to spare. If five or six House Freedom Caucus types are going to balk at this, if Kevin McCarthy fears not getting enough is going to end his speakership. That's where these things can start to go to the brink, even in a way they haven't in the past. Just picking up on that, I mean, I go back to those Boehner days and and that majority that was ushered in, and it was a real pro-austerity bunch. I mean, that was what was in the water back then. And I think that that was something that really gave John Boehner a lot of momentum going into these negotiations. And I think that what this has kind of laid bare is (laughs) how little strength Kevin McCarthy has as speaker, and that must make the dynamics of these negotiations very strange. I'm curious. I mean, I have no insight into the the murkiness or, or what goes on in, inside the room, but uh, he has to be aware of that. And he came up here to New York a couple of weeks back and spoke to executives, spoke at the New York Stock Exchange. And I'm very curious what he said to those executives and how much support he has, how much support Republicans in Congress have of kind of run-of-the-mill financial executives and general executives who operate big businesses here based in in New York. But to digress a little bit here, I mean, I I think it's funny, 
<laughs> like the other two of you, I've covered this over and over again, and it's funny to see this process being normalized. And I think there is this kind of rhetoric that is continuous throughout that, you know, this shouldn't be something on which we negotiate budget terms. But it seems clear now, many decades into this being normal, that this is the, the forcing mechanism to have these conversations for better or worse and kind of highlights the fact that traditional budgeting, as we all know, is kind of dead in, in Washington. And this, for better or worse, seems to be the only moment when there are these conversations that do crop up, it seems, in D.C. about what a budget should entail or what a government should be spending. And that's interesting to use a, a hollow word, but I think it is a facet of the way Washington works today when it comes to, to fiscal matters. I think it's a great point and not a digression because I, the predictions of what happens with the default start with a stock market plunge and a likely recession and whatever the American public decides about that if Wall Street you know, blames McCarthy and the Republicans on it. That has to have big implications going forward. All right. So constructive, if not sanguine, and 1157 or 1159, we leave it here maybe for another week. Anyway, let's move along to um, the former president who oddly figures in to these and all the other debates. In a not atypical story, CNN writes yesterday, new glimpse into documents case suggests a fateful new reckoning is looming over Trump. We're talking about 16 pieces of paper that Archives is going to be sending along to Jack Smith. Is it an important piece of the puzzle for him, or is it your sense that he already has what he needs to show guilty uh, knowledge on Trump's part? That's the most legal question I'll ask the whole hour, I promise. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is going to sound yeah. like a cop-out, but yeah. it, it depends on what's in the documents. Yeah. But I do think this gets at kind of the central question here, which is what Donald Trump did with these documents is not the same as what Joe Biden did, is not the same as what Mike Pence did. It's not just about taking the documents in the first place or even the volume of the documents. It's about what was done after NARA came calling, after there were these negotiations that begun. And basically, it, it seems to me that this is going to revolve around the idea that, you know, Donald Trump and his lawyers will argue there was some kind of legitimate dispute over whether these documents were his. And part of that has been claiming, I think, more publicly than in court, but I think in court a little bit, too, that these documents may have been declassified. They, they've avoided saying that directly, but they've held that out there as a possibility, suggesting that this could be part of their defense. And so to the extent that these 16 documents show that the people in the White House understood that you can't just magically, you know, with your mind declassify these documents, to the extent that actually proves that the people involved knew this, that maybe Donald Trump knew this, that would certainly undermine this kind of defense of that there was a legitimate legal disagreement about whether he could have these documents. But, you know, whether it's a smoking gun or not, I think it's, it's, it's way too early to say. And yet he keeps talking about this automatic declassification. I mean, he, the former president, bringing it up again at that town hall. And my sense of it is, as somebody who's not covering this day in, day out, but is, is following this, is that we've had, I don't know, dozens of people within the administration <laughs> calling foul on that and, and explaining that this was widely known not to be the case. And, and in the Trump administration, right? Yes, not to, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And so to your initial question, I mean, I, I think that Jack Smith has a lot. I think this is sort of more more fodder for him. But I'm struck how the, the, <laughs> the more things change, the more they stay the same, especially when it comes to, to the former president. So I don't think we know, and we have some of these breathless occasional stories that it's any minute, whatever. But I think it becomes more and more clear that it's going to happen. So picking up on what you just said, David, you have the former president going every time in public, just doubling down and doubling down. And even more in the town hall, he actually said, yeah, I took them when I was in the White House and I'm allowed to, et cetera. It had never been clear that he had physically copped to being the guy who took him when he was president. That could have real implications for both his liability and venue, which is a big question here, but too legal for today. But <laughs> he is nevertheless getting out there and digging himself into a hole legally. Any sense it's always perilous with Trump, but does he think that somehow the political gain will save him legally? Is there any thought or consciousness of this whole other realm that potentially, like his former lawyer Ty Cobb says yesterday to Aaron Burnett, is going to land him in jail? He seems not just indifferent to it, but completely dismissive in a very you know high-handed Trumpian way. 
I think that there were a lot of people who thought that it was going to be this kind of radical change moment when he, you know, flew in his private plane up to New York and had to appear before a judge that was going to sort of change the tenor of him or his attitude toward what might happen when it comes to the legal system. And I <laughs> call me skeptical, but I don't detect much, much of a change there. And to your point, Harry, I think that I think he still believes that he or politics or he and politics are going to get him out of this. I, I don't know that it's either willful ignorance or just a, a belief that he's, he's above it all still. But you're right. I mean, that, that was a striking moment in that town hall when, yeah, he flouted the law <laughs> so demonstrably and so concisely. And it seemed, again, like more of the same that, you know, he didn't seem chastened in any way a, as a result of all of this. And I think as he kind of moves full steam ahead toward the primaries and, and whatever comes after that, I think that these legal matters still seem to me, as I watch him, like, like a nuisance to him. He regards them as a nuisance and nothing more. We shall see. But there's more than one gnat for him to swat now, of course, as, as he's bothered by all of this. But yeah, it strikes me that he doesn't seem, at least publicly, that chastened or, or that reduced as a result of them. I was just going to do a quick note on the CNN town hall thing. It would be a real irony if that wound up being a significant moment in his criminal cases, given all the blowback that has been visited upon CNN for having this town hall right. in the in the first place. At the very least, it was an opportunity for people to who are not Trump's allies, like on Fox News, to be asking him questions like this and allowing him to say things like this that could actually wind up mattering. But sorry, go ahead, Amma. No, I was just going to say to David's point, I, I think it's right. He views these as a nuisance and something that will kind of cause stumbles, but not really provide much of an obstacle. But it's also, I think, viewed as a real political advantage. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should discount that because it's not as if Mr. Trump doesn't want to talk about these things. He talks about them all the time because it feeds into this narrative of politically motivated, targeted investigations, that these are democratic hoaxes. And this is across the board, not just with the documents case, but with the attempts to overturn the 2020 election case, with the prosecution in Manhattan, with the Georgia case, like all of this feeds into this grievance politics. I'm being targeted. They're coming after me. And it works. He fundraises off of it. We even saw when he went to Manhattan to face those charges, he raised money off that. And I think that, you know, don't want to conflate the two. There is an absolutely legal process that's unfolding here. And, and I am not a lawyer, it's much real. to my parents' yeah. chagrin, so I cannot <laughs> speak to that. But there's also this political public facing one. The two are having a very real impact on each other. It's so true. And let's just stick to the political side. I mean, during a, a period in which he is a judge by a jury to be a sexual predator, where he's indicted for the first time ever, where there are more coming, he's maybe doubled the space between him and his nearest challenger. After the Carroll verdict, people said, well, maybe that will loosen some support. But just thinking of it in political terms, do you see any prospect that as bad as it goes legally for him, Jack Smith indicts, Jack Smith convicts, etc., that that will significantly erode support enough for him to actually lose the nomination? Not looking at like it so far, right? Yeah. In the primary, I would have to say if history is a guide, then no. We have not seen any erosion in his primary voting support consistently over the last several months, regardless of how many probes have been introduced, regardless of all the findings of the January 6th committees, regardless of all the evidence that's come out and information that's come out from any one of these probes. In the general, I think there are some answered questions around the E. Jean Carroll case in particular. If you know you are weak, particularly among suburban women, particularly among independents, does being found liable for sexual abuse matter to those voters? Does it keep them at home? Does it make them think twice? We don't yet know because, again, we are in unprecedented territory. But for the primary, no, I don't know that I believe it has any kind of significant impact based just on what we've seen so far. Yeah, I think the idea that a large segment of the Republican Party is going to look at the E. Jean Carroll verdict, even the classified documents thing, anything to do with January 6th as being disqualifying in their minds for Donald Trump to win their votes I don't think is likely. I think where this starts to be an issue is if there starts to be a recognition, and this is a long ways off and we haven't seen it yet, that these things are hurting the party's chances of winning the election. Now, having said that, if you look at all the general election polling, 
Ron DeSantis does better than Donald Trump. And Republicans still think Donald Trump has a better chance of winning than Ron DeSantis. So it's not like people are going to be starting to look at, at these polls and these general election polls if Trump is losing ground and suddenly think, oh, maybe this guy isn't electable after all. There is a certain amount of faith that is built up in Trump that isn't responsive to this data that's being put out there, isn't responsive to these polls. And I tend to think that it would have to be a very, very bad situation for that electability argument to really start reasserting itself in a way that we thought it might after the 2022 election. Yeah, I mean, there's a boomerang effect to all of these things. You can see him being led away in handcuffs and it just being all the more confirmation of the deep state and all the more reasons that people want to support him politically. Talk about an unprecedented situation. I want to return for a second because you mentioned the CNN town hall and the heat that CNN took for that coverage. And we know well that his path to the presidency was really paved in 2015 by the cable stations just kind of slavishly covering him no matter what. He was news, he was watchable, etc. So you're all journalists. How should media companies be covering Trump? Do you have any particular feelings as a member of the media for the town hall and for how you would think about things going forward if you were president of media companies, which I very much hope you will never be because it seems to be one of the most <laughs> unstable positions in American life. <laughs> I feel very uncomfortable about setting up these events. I mean, I think that that's where yeah. a lot of the criticism has been directed at CNN for assembling this clack largely of Trump supporters or at least Republicans who could be willing to vote for him and perhaps instructing them on how they should react to what the former president said. I understand the motivations for for doing the town hall. I think there are many and ratings is, is up there. That's one of them. And I think this eagerness to get the former president on a channel that's not Fox News or, or Newsmax was probably an enticement as well. But I'm not sure that the town hall format worked. I mean, I don't think that we're, we're here talking about, or in the weeks since we've talked about the questions raised by those who were in the audience. I mean, I think it's about his performance in that town hall and how Caitlin Collins, the moderator, did in, in trying to hold him to account and not to pull back the curtain too much, but there have been a lot of conversations among me and my colleagues here just about the merits of doing a live interview or a live event like that. Yeah, with pull back the you know curtain. What you're what gonna the get. hell? <laughs> talking feds. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, so Stephen Skeep, who hosts Morning Edition, wrote, I thought, a very thoughtful piece on his Substack just about, you know, when we do something live or we don't. And I think that there is a lot of satisfaction and you can get a lot more out of a taped interview that you can kind of buff it with context. You can push back on things that might be false. You can cut out stuff that you you know isn't <laughs> isn't true or is reiterative or besides the point. I don't know why that event was live. To be honest, we know that there weren't preconditions on it, but like, Cable news loves things that are live, and I think that's probably why why it was. But I think back on interviews or events with former President Trump that have been satisfying. I thought a lot about the town hall that Savannah Guthrie did during the height of COVID. It was supposed to be a town hall with both of the candidates that ended up just being him. And you know, she was roundly praised for that. She pushed back on him. It didn't have the kind of – I guess what I'm getting back to is it didn't have the kind of audience interaction that we saw at that town hall in New Hampshire. And I think that for me that's the biggest lesson of this is that media shouldn't be or isn't well served by being the creator of the, the spectacle like that. One of my big takeaways, I think. I would echo almost all that. I think I tend to be less of a critic of this kind of thing than other people do for the reasons that David mentioned, which is that – this is an opportunity to interview Donald Trump, and it's not on Newsmax or Fox News where people are talking about what he wants. They're giving him very sympathetic questions about it. I think that there is value in that, but it's very difficult within that. And the audience situation, I would love to know more about how that came together because I also think kind of the whole normalizing thing is a little bit overblown. But that was a town hall that was piped into people's living rooms showing a lot of people in the audience applauding these things that Donald Trump was saying that weren't true and uh, various other problems with them. And so that's where I tend to be a little bit more sympathetic to some of the criticisms of CNN. I would just add to that too, I think, and I think all news organizations have been having these conversations, not just after the town hall, but for years. And I don't think anyone has entirely figured it out. The question is not should we cover him? We have to cover him. We had to cover him when he was president because he was president of the United States. We, I feel, have an obligation to cover him now because he is still one of the party's frontrunners for the nomination and a major force within our two-party system. And I think that's 
our obligation to our, our viewers and our audience and the American public. The question is how, right? And that is where we still very, very much struggle because it's clear now. It was clear after 2016, it was laid bare after the town hall that the norms by which we usually function in, in doing these kinds of things no longer apply. They just aren't good enough. And it's unfortunate, I think, only because it seems like we're learning in real time. And I worry sometimes that does a disservice to the American public, but it's clear it's going to continue to be a factor and, and no one has figured it out. So look, would, would any one of us want to be able to interview Donald Trump? Absolutely. He should be interviewed. He should face questions. We should put questions to him on behalf of the American people. How we do that, we haven't figured out yet. It's time now for our sidebar feature in which we ask a well-known person to explain an important legal concept in the news. And the topic today is the Congressional Committee Structure. Most of the real activity, horse trading, and power plays in Congress occur not in the full body, but in committees, subcommittees, and staffing of committees. How does all that work? And to provide an overview, I'm thrilled to welcome... Paula Poundstone. Paula Poundstone is a prolific stand-up comedian and author. She starred in several HBO specials, including Cats, Cops and Stuff, and Paula Poundstone Goes to Harvard. She's also written two books, most recently, The Totally Unscientific Study of the Search for Human Happiness. And she hosts the comedy podcast, Nobody Listens to Paula Poundstone. In 1992, Paula became the first female comic to host the White House Correspondents' Dinner. So I give you Congressional Committee Structure and Paula Poundstone. In the 2022 midterm elections, Republicans won a narrow majority of seats in the House of Representatives, 222 out of 435. The Republican takeover means the GOP controls the size, composition, agenda, and leadership in various House committees. Democrats, meanwhile, maintained a slim control of the Senate by a 51 to 49 edge. So they generally control committees in that body. Why is control of committee composition and work so important? For starters, almost all of the important legislative work of both the House and Senate occurs at the committee or subcommittee level. We see the full bodies gathered for the State of the Union or pivotal final votes, but that is a very small percentage of federal legislators' work. The committees are the first, and in most cases, the last stop of proposed legislation and congressional action. Of the thousands of bills introduced each year, only a small fraction are even considered in the full House or Senate. After bills are introduced, they are sent to the appropriate committee to undertake investigations, hold hearings, gather information, and recommend legislation to the full chamber. The actual wording of bills, and therefore the lion's share of the negotiation, lobbying, and political horse trading, is determined in committee. Committees also perform oversight of government operations and evaluate nominees for executive and judicial branch positions. Senators and representatives are very intent on getting favorable committee assignments. Committee nominations must be made in line with party rules and assignment is governed by the overarching rules of the House or Senate. In practice, however, senior party leaders in both chambers generally enjoy great authority in assigning committees posts, and they use the selections to consolidate their own power and further the party's political and legislative agendas. Committees can be standing, special, select, or joint. The standing committees, 16 in the Senate and 20 in the House, have jurisdiction over big-ticket, substantive areas such as budget, foreign affairs, and homeland security. In addition, both chambers have special or select committees. A prominent recent example is the Select Subcommittee on the Weaponization of the Federal Government, created by the incoming Republican House majority under the leadership of Representative Jim Jordan. The most important joint committees are conferences created with representatives of both the House and Senate to reconcile competing versions of the same bill. Once the committee agrees on a compromise, the revised bill is returned to both houses of Congress for their approval. For Talking Feds, I'm Paula Poundstone. 
Thank you so much, Paula Poundstone, for that explanation. Paula will be touring across the country this summer, and you can visit her website, paulapoundstone.com, for tour dates and tickets. And now, a word from our sponsor, the American Civil Liberties Union. Hello, I'm Leah Watson, Senior Staff Attorney for the ACLU's Racial Justice Program. State lawmakers and school boards across the country are trying to silence discussions about race and gender in our classrooms through discriminatory censorship measures like Florida's so-called Stop Woke Act. The ACLU and its partners sued to block enforcement of this law in higher education, and a federal judge delivered a resounding victory, preliminarily ruling that the Florida law violated the First and Fourteenth Amendments. This win recognizes that the Stop Woke Act restricts the free and open exchange of ideas related to race in our classrooms. The censored discussions erase the history of marginalized individuals. The ACLU is committed to defending our right to learn. We will continue to fight unconstitutional attempts to silence instruction about Black and brown people, women and girls, and LGBTQ plus individuals. Learn more at aclu.org slash censorship. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thank you, Harry. In today's spirited debate, Bordeaux and Napa face off, pitting the Bordeaux Reds against the California Cabs. From a numbers standpoint, the Bordeaux region is the clear winner with more wineries and higher production of bottles, producing nearly six and a half times more wine than Napa. But more doesn't necessarily mean better. Bordeaux wines are a blend of five different grapes. The Bordeaux region is actually divided by an estuary and two rivers forming the left bank and the right bank. Left bank wines are predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon based, featuring more tannins and bigger overall structure. Right bank wines are predominantly Merlot based, richer in fruit, with a softer mouthfeel and less tannin and acidity. Now, much like the left bank, Napa wines are predominantly Cabernet Sauvignon and well-known for their rich, bold style. Many of these wines are also blends, but you can also find 100% varietal wines from Napa. So whether you're Team Bordeaux or Team Napa, your local Total Wine & More has a huge selection so you can enjoy the best of both worlds at a price that won't break the left or right bank. So find what you love and love what you find. Only a Total Wine and More. Cheers. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine and More for today's A Spirited Debate. So we've segued from Trump's legal troubles into more political matters involving 2024 campaign. We were going to talk about that anyway, and let's go with it. So let's start with DeSantis. According to a lot of sources, he's going to officially enter the race uh, next week. But it's a funny period when I think he wanted to consolidate his, you know, bona fides as a governor in Florida, and he's passed all these very conservative, so-called anti-woke. In the process, though, he's been losing ground like crazy. Did he wait too long to actually engage as a candidate, do you think? I don't know that he waited too long. I think it was always going to be an uphill battle. It's not like he hasn't been acting like a candidate for the last few months. Very true. He's not doing the the daily New Hampshire events and Iowa events like you necessarily would, but he's got what is, for all intents and purposes, a campaign operation. He is making trips. He's being asked about what Donald Trump is saying about him. He's had a chance to kind of put his vision out there and to let people know. And I and I also think that there was always going to be potentially a little bit of a return to normal after the 2022 election. There was a debate after 2022 about how Donald Trump helped the Republican Party lose its third straight election effectively, how his candidates underperformed. And I think some of that penetrated, you know, even on outlets like Fox News, but making people care about that into March, April, May of the off year and remember that is a much more difficult thing. So maybe Ron DeSantis being an actual candidate and making that electability argument a little bit more frequently on the actual campaign trail would matter, but also sustaining that argument over the course of a year before the Iowa caucuses, New Hampshire primaries was always going to be very difficult. And so I tend to think he's not as sunk as other people 
think he is, but I also think it was kind of inevitable that this would revert to the way the Republican Party has been for a few years, which is that there's kind of a third of the party that's willing to entertain alternatives and around half that are pretty committed to Donald Trump. Let me just quickly follow up with you on this and then go around. When you say he's not as you don't think he's as sunk as others do, is that basically because you think Trump has a long way to fall or because you think he has a long way to rise? I don't know that I've necessarily seen Ron DeSantis shining, you know, being a shining star in these appearances that we've seen. I think last weekend in Iowa was one of his better times as a candidate, but we've certainly seen some awkwardness. His kind of indecision on how he wants to handle Trump is has been a little bit questionable. And the thing we have to remember here is a lot of times we see these governors rise out of kind of nowhere to become these stars. There's been comparisons, of course, to Scott Walker, other governors who did really well on a state level. And then when they tried to enter the national political scene, it didn't work out so well. Ron DeSantis was kind of a backbench house member up until 2018. So this is new to him, people in Florida like him. But the idea that that's necessarily going to translate to the national stage, I think, is is, a, you know, we shouldn't necessarily assume that. All right. How about a related argument then on electability? Because, you know, he's now saying apparently to donors, it's Trump, Biden or me. He has passed this wave of really severe social culture wars legislation in Florida. Judging from the 2022 election, that wouldn't serve him very well as a national candidate. Does he risk becoming unelectable from his attempt to be so hard right on the culture war issues? Or is it just a matter of, I'll cross that bridge when I come to it for now, I've just got to figure out a way to the nomination. It's definitely a risk, but I think that that's like the the legacy that he's solidified here is being the architect of of all of that. And he certainly has a lot to point to. And I, I come from North Carolina, a state that's kind of taken or replicated some of what's been passed in Florida. And you've seen that in places across the country, that these kind of very hard right, social focused issues that he's seized on in Florida, you've seen other states kind of replicate them. And I, I think you're right. I mean, I think there is a risk there going forward, but he's been all, all in on that. <laughs> I think it's yeah. like fair to say he's, I mean, that's sort of what he's banking on. So I, I don't think that he can make much of a case that he's evolved away from that, or this was some aberration. I think it, it is what he's building his campaign on. But to get back to something you said, I think People who love Donald Trump love Donald Trump. And as long as he's a viable candidate, I don't see those people who love Donald Trump peeling away from them for Ron DeSantis and or anyone else for that matter. And I think that that's the chief complication for him. I mean, yes, he can kind of run as this more, not more anything, I guess just not Donald Trump. But I think that there are just enough people within the party who see him as the figurehead, the leader of that party. And why would they go with with anything else? Yeah, to that point, it feels like we know where Trump's floor is, right? And it is held steady, and that has yeah. always been his floor. The question is, well, where is his ceiling? And I think we're still figuring all of that out. But the DeSantis argument is that Trumpism without the Trump, right? For all the reasons that people were uncomfortable with the way Mr. Trump conducted himself, that Ron DeSantis could be a viable alternative. That doesn't seem to be a compelling enough argument for primary voters, at least. And that is, of course, the most obvious and necessary hurdle for any candidate at this stage. But you have to remember, he's you know, Ron DeSantis has already complicated matters even within the party for himself a little bit. He's had these wavering views on how to handle the war in Ukraine, this whole prolonged battle with Disney, which is going on with two years now. And that makes a lot of Republicans uncomfortable, too, particularly in his own state, that to take on a private business that way. And you saw that have a real political impact to some degree. I mean, Mr. Trump pulled some endorsements from Florida Republicans. So all of that has meant a little bit of a hit for Ron DeSantis himself. But I think the, the argument you're hearing now, too, is if this announcement does come next week, and again, it could change, who knows. But if it does come, this allows him to, A, you know, supporters to more intentionally start fundraising for him, and also could allow him to more directly and intentionally push back against Mr. Trump. And we know that Donald Trump has already been targeting him in a way that he hasn't been any of the other declared or potential candidates. So a lot of these questions I think we have about how the two would fare against each other could be answered pretty quickly. David, you nodded at the Disney point. I know the least of all of the four of us, but it struck me as such an enormous blunder and a characteristic, I want to out Trump Trump. So he saw it as a one-on-one -on -one cowboy move. But even if in a way he, you know, beats them, 
He loses, doesn't he? A billion dollar development project leaving Florida, all these jobs. That strikes me as a pretty solid argument for anybody against DeSantis, that he's not a good manager, a good steward of an economy. And it struck me he's really way overplayed that hand. Is this a a real strike against him he's going to have to answer for going forward? No, I think getting back to what we were just talking about, I think there's a lot of unease about this matchup that he's had with Disney. And he's been, (laughs) I don't want to say outmanned by Disney, but it's the company's been a pretty formidable adversary here yeah. throughout all of this and in court and now with this latest decision to to take money out of the state, as you just mentioned, you know, the prospect of there being more jobs and investment in and around Orlando. I think that it has been problematic for him. I think it's going to get increasingly problematic. And I think that what you're seeing now is, you know, him initially thinking that he could score a point escalated to now that he's, he's I, I feel like he's almost sticking with it out of peak and he's not thinking through sort of what this means. <laughs> yeah, but, right. He wants to win. And I just think I, I've never lived in Florida. I, I know many Floridians but <laughs> talking about Disney as, as an adversary. It seems like an unlikely one here. It's right, a company exactly. that is so closely tied to this state and has been such an economic boon for so, so long. It just seems like folly that you would really take this company on in the way in which he has. We've seen this loss that we can now measure in billions. I think there probably is great fear that that could escalate even more. I'll also add to that, you know, I spent some time on the ground reporting from Florida, and this was more around the the 2022 midterms, but I talked to all these folks who stood out in real heat for over an hour just to hang out in a parking lot to hear Ron DeSantis talk for another hour or so. And these were folks who were super Ron DeSantis fans. They really, really liked their governor, right? When I spoke to them, to a T, every single person I talked to in that county said, we love him, we love him but we think he should wait four more years. We think (laughs) Donald Trump needs four more years. And that may be what he's up against. Aaron, you wrote about Pence, and there are other names, Hutchinson, Nikki Haley, Scott. I don't think anybody would give them big odds for emerging at the end of the day. But how do you see, or how does any of you see their presence in the race impacting the overall dynamic, even if it is a DeSantis-Trump one-on-one in essence. Does it matter at all? Are they, are they, someone mentioned Nats not long ago, are they just, you know, Nats in the room that really have no impact at all on who becomes the nominee? It really is kind of remarkable. This, this week seems to be the week that we learn that a whole bunch of people that we assume have no chance of actually winning the nomination are going to run. (laughs) I would put Pence as maybe having a little bit better shot than some of the others. You know, I'm talking about Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota. Chris Christie is apparently getting very close. Chris Sununu seems like he is likely to run. I think that the idea that any of these people have a real chance seems far flung. At this time in 2016, of course, the idea that Donald Trump would win seemed far flung. I don't think it's necessarily the same kind of situation because there is a front runner that is so ingrained in the party right now. What Mike Pence needs, and he needs a lot, the problem is that he is just not on the radar for people in a way that a former vice president should. There was a poll a few weeks ago that showed that 57% of Republicans said they wouldn't even consider voting for Mike Pence. Yeah. This is the Donald Trump's vice president we're talking about here. His numbers dropped off a cliff after January 6th because he didn't help overturn the election. They haven't recovered since then. So what Pence is banking on, and it's really because it's the only thing he can bank on, is that there is some kind of a reversion to the Reagan Republican Republican Party. Whether that can happen over the course of several months, of course, is very unlikely, it seems. But, you know, Mike Pence has been eyeing this for a while, and apparently he's going to give it a go and hope things fall into place. But really, what he and pretty much everybody else needs, including Ron DeSantis, is for something to happen with Donald Trump, somebody to take down Donald Trump. And the problem is that very few people want to actually effectuate that, with one exception maybe being Chris Christie. And there's very few not knowing really how, it seems. The one thing we've heard consistently from folks who are both have declared and also people I've interviewed who are, are among the potential candidate field was it doesn't really matter. They keep saying it doesn't matter how many people get in. Like I think everyone who wants to get in should get in and give voters a chance to take a look at them and really lay out their views. Even among those who agree that they do not want Donald Trump to be the nominee, though, they all say the key to this is people getting out in time. And no one seems to agree on when that might be, right? Because the idea is, okay, if there's a certain 
portion, enough of a, of a constituency among Republicans who agree that they don't want Donald Trump to be the nominee. You're going to have to coalesce behind a single candidate in some organized way by a certain time, the X date of this conversation, yeah. I guess. <laughs> but no one agrees on, on, on when that might be. And so I think that's going to be interesting to see because we are just now, this week really, and then in the next month or so, seeing that Republican field start to take shape in some kind of organized infrastructure way. And, and we'll see from there. Yeah, we end where we start and not knowing when uh, when midnight is on a, at least a different <laughs> clock. Let's just close out with a quick look at the Democrats. A very odd dynamic in a way in that their standard beer seems incredibly unpopular, especially if you look at his achievements, but be that as in May. But they've put out a strategy memo that basically changes the focus to the retention of the key battleground states, you know, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, et cetera. When you look at the race from the vantage point of the electoral map rather than the standard bearers, does it seem as if the Democrats have a pronounced advantage, even if the president's ratings are so poor? I mean, the thing about Biden's numbers is that they are soft and Democrats don't want him to run for president again. Many, if not most, Democrats don't want him to run again. But if you dig a little bit deeper, what you'll see is that even more so than in the Republican Party, the Democrats say, well, if he is the nominee, I'll wind up voting for him. So it's not that Democrats hate Joe Biden and are really pushing for moving on. It's more of kind of a passive It'd be nice if we weren't running an 80-year-old guy who I don't really love, but I'll vote for the guy. And, you know, the greatest motivator, of course, back in 2020 was the person on the other side of the ticket, right. which it appears that they'll have again in 2024. All right. I guess that's an end for now. We only have a couple minutes anyway for our final feature of Talking <laughs> 5, where we take a question from a listener and each of us has to answer in five words or fewer. So today's question is, what will Jim Jordan, chair of the newly minted subcommittee on the weaponization of the federal government, what will be his next hearings or subject of investigation? Five words or fewer. Anybody. How about who's prepping Dan Goldman? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, did he did he <laughs> eviscerate him in that hearing yesterday? I thought, okay, very good. And a word left over. All right. I'll say the Spurs and Victor Wembanyama. <laughs> People can look this up. It's it's too improbable and it needs <laughs> scrutiny. The Spurs have a history with French players. They have a history with big men. The Wizards should have gotten this pick. There's something <laughs> there's something wrong here. The woke NBA set this up. Oh, I know there it. You go. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's looking like a Lakers Celtics final, possibly. Amna. How am I going to top that? Come on. You can just try for a close second. Close second. I'll take it. Yeah. Although I really hate coming in second. Yeah. Uh, how about what other Biden family member can I investigate? That's too many words. <laughs> Eight words, but another fa Biden family member. <laughs> that go. one's fine. All right. I am going with vegetarians in the State Department. <laughs> <laughs> we are out of time. Thank you very much to Amna, Aaron, and David. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a moment to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on YouTube, where we post daily video content breaking down legal developments in the news. You can follow us on Twitter at Talking Feds Pod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for supporters. This week, we've posted a conversation with Jessica Levinson about the recent Fifth Circuit oral arguments regarding the challenge to the FDA's approval of abortion medication Mifepristone. Talking Feds is a completely independent production. So if you like the work we do and the spirit moves you to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. And you get a lot of excellent content to boot. Submit your questions to questions at talkingfeds.com. Whether it's for Talking Five or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in. And don't worry. As long as you need answers, the feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Olivia Henriksen. 
Sound engineering by Matt McArdle. Rosie Don Griffin and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Rhea Cohen Gilbert, Emma Maynard, and Kalena Tano. Special thanks to Emily Buss and Mike Doss for help on this episode. Our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Feds is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later.